Okay, welcome everybody. Can everyone hear me? We're going to get started. Okay. All right. Um, good Monday afternoon, everybody, and welcome to the April edition of Trainee Talks. Trainee Talks is a monthly webinar series that showcases the research topics of our CREATE graduate students in their area of interest related to software engineering and AI. And I think most of you know me. My name is Lori Akiyama. I'm the program coordinator for CREATE SC4 AI at Concordia University, and I'll be moderating the webinar today. Um, so today we are pleased to have two PhD students from Polytechnique Montreal who are studying under Dr. Futskam, Vahid and Farog with us today to deliver their talks. Vahid Majdi Nasab is a PhD student in software engineering. His research interests include reinforcement learning, multi-agent systems, evolutionary algorithms, and automatic code synthesis. His current research focuses on the challenges and pitfalls of training and deploying LLMs trained on code. And Vahid will be speaking today about mutation testing of deep reinforcement learning based on real faults. Immediately following Vahid's talk, we will hear from Farog Majidi, who is in her second year of her PH program studying software engineering for machine learning applications. Farog will be presenting her current work on automated machine learning tools. This webinar is currently being recorded and will be available to view on our CREATE website at sc4ai.org and also on our YouTube channel. So I'll ask that as usual, you please keep yourselves on mute until the Q&A session at the end of each speaker. So with that, I am very pleased to turn things over to Vahid to begin his talk. Hello, everyone. Thank Ms. Alkiyama for the introduction. So let me just share my screen. Uh, it's all right, right? Oh, so yeah, we can see my screen. Perfect. So hi, everyone. My name is Vahit, and today I want to share with you one of our works regarding mutation testing for deep reinforcement learning that I did with one of my colleagues in our lab. And so without further ado, let's start with reinforcement learning. So reinforcement learning is a machine learning paradigm that is based on mimicking how humans learn through trial and error. In reinforcement learning, you place your agent in an environment that is meant to simulate what your agent is going to work in, and you allow your agent to explore. The result of these explorations are observations that the agent makes as the result of the action that it takes in the environment. So a positive reward is given to the agent when it does something right. So when it's going in the direction of achieving its goal or a negative reward or punishment is given to the agent when it does something wrong. Deep reinforcement learning is a subfield in reinforcement learning that uses deep neural networks to learn from agents' experiences that allow it to learn very complex tasks. In practice, reinforcement learning is used when we don't know the optimal solution to a problem or when finding a solution with traditional approaches is just too complex to compute. Now, deep reinforcement learning has been successfully applied to a lot of different domains like robotics, gaming, and natural language processing. And in each of these domains, uh, DRL agents have been able to either achieve or surpass human level performance. Now that we have a baseline for what reinforcement learning is, let's briefly talk about machine learning testing. So in Traditional software, and by traditional here, I mean software that does not incorporate any machine learning components in it. What you have is that the logic that you want is implemented by the developers. Where in machine learning, the logic is not implemented, but it is instead inferred from the data that the model is trained on instead. So because this underlying logic is not implemented, testing machine learning software becomes a bit difficult because we need to ensure that we have tested the machine learning components or programs extensively, but we don't have a guideline provided by the developers to us to follow. 
So these issues raise some challenges that are unique to machine learning testing. For example, what exactly should be tested? The model, parts of the model, or how do we ensure that the results of our testing are valid? Uh, in other words, how can we make sure that the model is behaving exactly as we want it to behave? So the most basic test that any developer that wants to train a machine learning program does involves evaluating their model's performance on data sets that are similar to what the model was uh, trained on, but it's something that the model has not seen. And for purposes other than evaluating model training, such tests are not nearly comprehensive enough. So since machine learning components are now being used in safety critical applications like autonomous driving and aviation control, thorough testing of machine learning models is becoming more and more important because if we don't find errors in these models, their failures can have serious consequences. For example, a real scenario that happened way back was that a Tesla drove into a tractor because it could not distinguish between the actual road and what was being reflected off of the silver paint of that tractor, and it believed that nothing else was on the road. So for reasons such as these, a lot of approaches are being proposed for machine learning testing, and very broadly speaking, all of these approaches can be broken down into two categories. Either they are approaches that are adopted from traditional software and testing, or they are approaches that are specifically designed for machine learning. And it's not only the safety critical models that we need to be concerned about and that need testing. Models that are being used in other sectors, such as finance or medicine, also need to be tested for reliability and fairness as well. So machine learning testing as it is, is an active area of research and new techniques are being developed to address the unique challenges of all of these issues that I talked about. So let's take a detour to mutation testing. So one question that exists when testing software is how can we evaluate the tests themselves? In other words, how can we make sure that our tests are effective? One way to do this is through mutation testing, where we make small changes to the original program and we call them mutants, and we run a test suite on these mutants. The argument here is that if our tests can identify these mutants, which means that the mutants should fail the test, then we have a test suite with good quality. And if not, then we're gonna need some new tests. So the goal of mutation testing becomes creating representative, uh, representative mutations that can cover a range of possible faults that can happen within our program. Alongside assessing the quality of the test suite, the result of mutation testing can also help identify areas of the code that are difficult to test or are prone to errors. The downside here, however, is that mutation testing is computa computationally expensive. So there are strategies like selective mutation or higher order mutations that have been proposed to uh, solve this problem. And we're gonna cover them in a little bit. So mutation testing approaches have been proposed for machine learning components as well. Such approaches mainly involve creating mutants by modifying the model's architecture, the data that is used to train the model, or changing some of the model's hyperparameters. So mutation testing for machine learning is still an active area of research and is relatively new, so there are a lot of open questions and challenges. One of the main challenges that we are facing right now is identifying the appropriate mutations and how in-depth those mutations should be. For example, should we change the model's architecture during testing? And if so, to what degree? Another challenge is the high dimensionality of machine learning systems, since even small changes in values can change the entire decision-making process of the model. So creating representative mutants becomes very difficult. Now, 
In the past few years, research has been done on adopting mutation testing for supervised learning approaches as supervised learning models are becoming very common. However, not a lot of research has been done on mutation testing for reinforcement learning. The reasons for this is first, the stochastic nature of the environments in reinforcement learning, where one action in the environment can lead to many different situations. The other reason is the unpredictability of agents' behavior during training as it tries to explore the environment that it is in to find the optimal solution. So the previous works that have been done on mutation testing for reinforcement learning have proposed mutations such as modifying the environment during testing, which is basically testing the agent on an environment that is very different than what it was trained on, uh, or damaging the agent's neural network by removing a neuron or an entire layer, or adding noise to the agent's observations. The argument that can be made here, especially for modifying the environment and adding noise to the agent's observations, is that these tests are usually done to test the generalization capabilities and agents' robustness, so they can't uh, truly be considered mutation testing. This is where we come up. So we created a framework for mutation testing for reinforcement learning. It is based on real faults that can happen during designing the agents and faults that can happen during training the agents. So in order to do so, we based our work on a study that was done by some other colleagues in our lab, where they identified the faults that developers can make during training RL agents. We did this because we believed that the mutations should be realistic and specifically tailored for the reinforcement learning paradigm, rather than just adopting the same mutations from other machine learning paradigms. Our framework includes both first order mutations and higher order muta mutations, which are mutations that are comprised of first order mutations. So, in general, in our framework, we target three different components in the reinforcement learning paradigm, the environment, the agent, and the policy that the agent learns. So let's talk about our mutations for the environment level. Here, we try to simulate the faults that the developers can make when they're designing the RL environments that the agent is to be trained in. First, we have reward noise in which we add a Gaussian noise to the true reward that the agent was supposed to receive from the environment. Then we have the mangled operator, which damages the correlation between the collected experiences. So here, the agent receives an incorrect state and reward, reward pair for the action that it has taken. Then we have the random operator. So the random operator is similar to the mangled operator, but here the state and reward that are returned to the agent are not related to each other. So for example, the agent might receive a positive reward for an agent for, for an action that it should not have done in the first place. And finally, we have the repeat operator, which returns the observations from the previous time steps to the agent. For our agent level mutations, our aim was to simulate the faults that can happen during designing and training the agent, agents themselves. So most reinforcement learning algorithms require something called a discount factor that helps the agent distinguish between short and long-term rewards. The no discount factor operator removes this discount factor, which makes it difficult for the agent to find the right balance between these short and long-term rewards. The terminal state in an environment signals to the agent when an episode is over. So the missing terminal state operator removes this terminal state from the agent's observations so the agents can't see the signal. Now, some reinforcement learning algorithms need to reverse the order of the observations that they have made in order to trace back their decision-making uh, process. The no reverse operator removes this reversing process, which can lead to the agents learning an incorrect association between the states and rewards. The missing state uh, update operator removes the state update after the agent takes an action. 
So it is similar to the repeat operator where we return the previous observation to the agent. However, instead of it happening on an environment level, this is happening in an agent level. And finally, we have the incorrect loss function operator, which simulates the conditions where the developer implement, implements the wrong logic for the agency's loss, loss function. Now, the policy is what the agent has learned about how to behave in the environment. We have two mutation operators for policy level. The first one is the policy activation change, where we change the activation function of the agent's neural network. So for example, we change a ReLU to a sigmoid function. And then we have the optimizer change, which changes the optimizer that is used to update the agent's neural network. So for example, instead of atom, we use stochastic gradient descent. Now that we have our operators, we need to define the environments where we are going to test our agents. The argument that we make here is that in order for the tests to be meaningful, they, the agents need to be tested in the context that they were trained on. So for example, training an agent to drive and then testing it on flying an airplane is not a very meaningful test. However, since our aim here is to find faults, just testing on the exact environment that the agents were trained on doesn't tell us very much either. But on the other hand, if the environment is too different than what the agent was trained in, then the test is going to lose its relevancy. So here we need to find a sweet spot where the environment is not exactly as the same as what the agent was trained on, and yet it is not too different to, so that it's not relevant anymore. Our solution for this problem are frontier environments. So we define a frontier environment as an environment that has different parameters than the original one, but these parameters are not too different. Such environments would allow us to test the agent on two aspects simultaneously. First, what representations they have learned from their observations, and second, what mechanics of the environment they have learned. Now, to find these environments, we use healthy agents. So whenever I use healthy agents, I mean that these are the agents that we are sure that there is no fault in them. Like they are completely healthy, not mutants. Now, we use these healthy agents on, on our test environments that have different parameters, and we search for parameters where the healthy agents are incapable of operating in those environments anymore. So an example of it can be seen in this figure. So uh, the axes are centered on the original parameters for the environment, which in this case are gravity and site engine power. And we keep changing these parameters to create new environments. The orange dots here are environments where healthy agents fail. And the blue dots here are environments where healthy agents didn't fail. So, Here's an example to better, better illustrate the frontier environments. This is an environment called Cartpole, which is a fairly simple environment. On the right side, you can see the original environment where we haven't changed any parameters. And on the left side, you can see a frontier environment where we have changed the length of the pole. So our goal here is to look for environments that are lie just on the border between healthy and complete failure. So a healthy agent should be able to operate in those environments without a problem, and a mutant should fail in those environments. And here are results. So we tested our approach on two environments, Cardpole and Lunar Lander. For each environment, we experimented with three different reinforcement learning techniques, namely proximal policy optimization, advantage actor critic, and deep Q networks. So the numbers that you see here uh, next to some operators are the mean the probability of that mutation affecting the agent. So a number one here means that this operator was applied to every step that the agent made. We also have two different mutation killing criteria. R is when we set a threshold 
for what the rewards should be. And if any agent receives a reward that is lower than that threshold, we automatically kill it. And DTR, which is a statistical test that we do between the rewards that the agents have received, we compare them with the rewards that the healthy agents have received. And if they are too different, then we uh, kill those mutants. Now, if you look closely, you can see here, I've, I've underlined them in red, that just setting the threshold is not enough, as in some cases, is it, it's just not able to kill any mutant. However, the statistical test allows us to kill at least even one mutant and find uh, some tests that we can be sure, okay, this test works, now it needs improvement. And finally, you may be asking, what are these green rectangles? So except for these green rectangles, our tests show that we can detect all of these mutations by doing a statistical test. However, as you can see, out of the four tests that we did here, only three of them revealed the mutants. So this means this is a challenging test. So these mutations were not revealed during the testing. Here leads us to the concept of higher order mutations. Now, higher order mutations are comprised of combinations of first order mutations. So for example, you can have an agent that has an incorrect loss function and a mangled operator at the same time. Now, for our study, we limited our experiments to combinations of two muta uh, mutations at a time. The reason that we are allowed in, uh, we are interested in higher order muta mutants is that as we said, mutation testing is computationally expensive. In our case, we have to generate a lot of environments to find the frontier environments, then apply the mutation operators to each agent, train those agents and test them. So this becomes very computationally expensive and can take a lot of time. Higher order mutations allow us to lower the number of mutants that we need to create, thus lowering the computation expenses. Now, in order to create our higher order mutations, we need to follow four different categories based on literature. So first, we have non-subsuming mutants, which is where detecting the combination of the mutants is easier than detecting those muta mutants individually. Then we have weakly subsuming coupled mutants, where we have some tests that kill one mutant, some other tests that kill other mutants, and there are some tests that are shared between these two test suites that can kill the combination of these mutants as well. Then we have weakly subsuming decoupled mutants, which is when we have different tests killing different constituents and the tests that kill their combinations are not present in the set that kills each mutant individually. And finally, we have strongly subsuming couple mutants, where every test that kills the individuals is capable of killing, of killing a combination of those individuals as well. So if it gets a little bit confusing, here we're using subsuming as meaning uh, that there are more tests killing the individuals than there are tests that kill their combination. And here are results for uh, our higher order mutants. We were only able to find a strongly subsuming couple, couple tests for the card polling environment on PPO. And we were only able to do it when we set a reward threshold. We also did not have any weakly subsuming decoupled tests either. However, we have a lot of tests for weakly subsuming couple, which suggests that we can for, uh, further search for frontier environments or mutation combinations that can detect and kill these mutants individually and in, com uh, in combination. So in conclusion, we introduced our framework for mutation testing and reinforcement learning we defined three distinct categories of first order muta mutations based on real fa faults. We defined fr frontier environments, which can be used for evaluating these mutants. 
we define higher order mutations based on these first order mutations to lower the computational expense. And we have shown that our framework can detect first order mutants. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you very much, Fahid. Very interesting presentation. I can tell that you've gone to a lot of work on your study. Um, and now I'd like to open up the floor for anyone who might have a question for Vahid. And I see that Dr. Adams, you've raised your hand, so please go ahead. Hey, hi. Great. Thanks uh, for the presentation. Uh, very interesting. So, um, uh, great. So I, was, I had like two questions. So the first one, you said there was some initial work uh, looking at this and that they were doing like limited Kind of forms like adding noise and stuff like that but i noticed in your framework as well you also have cases where you add noise so i was just wondering are you or your is your framework like a, a superset of the existing techniques but a lot more additional things or totally different from uh, existing yeah. work uh so when we wanted to first do our work we did a uh, literature review to see what others have done uh the mutation operators that they use is basically either test uh, changing the environment so much that the environment does not resemble the environment that the agent was trained on. So we believe this is not representative because this is more a generalization test because if the agent fails in this environment, how can you say it is because it has not learned the mechanics of this changed environment or it is because like something was wrong during its training, like you made a mistake in the code. And uh, about adding noise, we also add noise to agency's observation, but this noise is done on the environment level. So it can be a fault when you are designing your own environment. And for example, let's say you want your rewards to be uh, done based on a uniform uh, distribution, and you make a mistake here. So the rewards that are being returned to the agent are incorrect. So the agent, it, even though the agent is uh, trying to learn and it's trying to learn correctly, uh, the state action reward tuple that it is receiving is not telling it that much about the mechanics of the environment. Right, yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, okay, good. And then, um, so in your evaluation, you use these two different environments uh, to evaluate things. So, so how easy is it to, uh, or how much work is it uh, to instantiate a framework in different environments? Yeah, so we basically support every environment that OpenAI Gems does. Uh, we wrote our framework on top of Stable Baselines 3, which is deeply integrated with OpenAI's Gem. So if it's an environment that stable baseline three supports, which is, I think most of Jim's environments, our framework supports it as well. Ooh, thanks. Thank you very much. Thank you, Bram. Does anyone else have a question for Vahid? We probably have time for one more question before we turn things over to Farouk. No questions? OK. Um, in that case, Fahid, thank you very much. I guess you can stop sharing your screen. Thank you very and much. Thank you. That was great. So uh, Farouk, you're up next. Please go ahead whenever you're ready. And I think Farouk, you're on mute, so you'll have to unmute yourself. Yeah, I'm. I'm. <laughs> Hello, everyone. Do you see my screen? Yes, it looks great. Hello, everyone. My name is Farouk Majiti. I'm a PhD student under the supervision of Professor Fusi Khom and uh, Professor Lee. And today I'm going to present uh, one of our works, which is an empirical study on the usage of automated machine learning tools. And uh, as you know, uh, the popularity of machine learning has increased dramatically over the past few years. And a lot of companies uh, use ML to increase their profit and uh, reach their goals. Data scientists should uh, do several tasks 
to use ML. Uh, in other words, ML contains several stages, which data scientists should go through most of them. And first, uh, they need to identify the model requirements. They need to collect data, clean data, label data, and uh, identify the features. For example, remove some features or add some features. And when the data set is ready for train, they train their models and evaluate the performance of the model. And if the performance is good enough, they deploy the model into their production, and then they monitor the model performance frequently to detect any uh, changes in the performance or anything else. And uh, there is an issue uh, with this pipeline uh, because um, Data scientists cannot go through steps only once. For example, for identifying the best hyperparameters, uh, data scientists need to try uh, different hyperparameters several times, and then they reach to the best set of hyperparameters, for example. Or they might need to uh, do feature engineering several times after each training. And this is kind of time consuming and it's not easy task for data scientists. Uh, therefore, a new tools called uh, automated machine learning tools have developed recently to help data scientists. What is this automated machine learning tools? Uh, automated tools are, uh, the goal of automated tool is to automate one or multiple stages of ML pipeline. For example, uh, some of the tools automate feature engineering, some of the tools automate model training, and some of the tools, for example, may help in data collection or data cleaning and so on. This way, data scientists can save time and effort. Uh, as an example, I can say that TPOD try to automate the whole ML pipeline, not automate, but at least it try to manage the whole ML pipeline or feature tool, uh, which is an um, automated tool works only on feature engineering part or hyper OPT only works on hyperparameter optimization and so on. Um, as I said, the popularity of these automated tools uh, has increased dramatically over the past few years, but we don't know how these tools are used in larger scale projects. Therefore, uh, the goal of this project, this research is to investigate more on the use of automated tools in larger scale projects and the result of this study can help ML practitioners to find the best set of tools to use in their projects or it can help the developer of these automated tools to improve their tools in the future. Okay, uh, we answered three research questions in this work. First, we identified the most used automated tools. Then we identified how do ML, how ML practitioners use automated tools. And finally, we were interested to know whether uh, two or multiple automated tools are used together in the same source code file or in the same project or not. To answer our research questions, we went through several steps. First, we identified a list of automated tools. Uh, we collected uh, 95 automated tools from Google website, and we collected the name of 31 tool from research papers. Then uh, we collected the information of those tools from GitHub using GitHub API, and we excluded the tools that have less than two contributors or they have zero star. Also, we were interested uh, in updated tools. We were not interested in the tools that are not uh, updated uh, recently. So we excluded the Ottoman tools that uh, were their last update was before 2022. So we finally remain with 57 Ottoman tools. And then in the third step, we collected uh, GitHub projects that use those Ottoman tools and their metadata. 
let me explain more about this step in the next slide. So in the right side of the screen, you see a sample of source code file. You see that TPAT is imported in this source code file. TPAT is an AutoML tool, as I said. Uh, TPAT is imported in this source code file. And uh, on top of the figure picture, you see that this source code file belongs to a repository called Silver, Silverster forward slash learn Python. Uh, we collected both the source code files and also the name of the repository that has this source code file. So uh, at the end, we collected, we extracted uh, 97,000 uh, source code files and 30, from 33,000 repositories. But we didn't need all, all of those uh, projects because some of them were, for example, uh, tutorial assignments or fork repository. So we excluded and removed uh, fork repositories, tutorial assignments, and uh, we remain with 55,000 source code files from 21,000 projects. And uh, now uh, we have all the source code files that import AutoML tools. And uh, we need to also collect the function calls. And the figure in the picture, you see that in this sample of source code file, uh, the functions of fit, score, and export are called from the TPOT tool. So uh, we use abstract syntax tree to collect all the function calls from the source code files. And now we have a list of function calls, source code files, and repositories. Now that we have our data set, we started analyzing the collected data to answer our research questions. Uh, the first research question was, uh, in the first research question, we were interested to know what are the most used AutoML tools. Uh, we sorted the tools based on the number of function calls. In the plot, you see that uh, the green bars show the top 10 most used AutoML tools, and the red bars show the tools that are not quite popular. So uh, Optuna, the top 10 most used AutoML tools are Optuna, Hyper-OPT, Scikit-Optimize, Feature Tool that do feature engineering, uh, TPAT, a bias opt optimized that do hyperparameter optimization, AutoKeras, AutoScikit-Learn, AX, which is for Facebook, and Snorkel, which works on data-oriented tasks. And also, we realized that the number of function of the top 10 AutoML tools cover up to 68% percentage of all the function calls in our data set. So, uh, we collected the information of repositories from GitHub. Uh, for example, we collected the age of the, the creation data of the repositories. We collected the number of commits, number of contributors, the number of forks from the GitHub and so on. And we analyzed the metadata that we collected and we realized that 70% uh, of the projects that use AutoML tools are less than five years old and have less than 50 commits and one star. This result indicates that uh, projects that use AutoML tools are mostly not mature enough and they are young. They are not very big projects with lots of commits or issues that, uh, yeah, young projects use AutoML tools and not mature projects. Yeah. In the second research question, uh, we were interested to know how ML practitioners use AutoML tools. Uh, we identified, we conducted a manual analysis and manual labeling to identify the purpose of using AutoML tools and also the stages of ML pipeline in which, in which these tools are being used. Um, 
yeah, this figure shows uh, the code example. This code example uh, shows the function calls corresponding to tpad. I said that before. Feed, score, and export are the function calls of the tpad. And we uh, sampled 690 most called function calls across different projects, and we applied manual analysis on them. And we realized that people mostly use hyperparam mostly use automated tools for hyperparameter optimization, model training, and model evaluation, and feature engineering. Uh, this result indicates that people mostly use automated tools for the stages of uh, for model oriented stages, not for data oriented uh, stages. This result indicates that maybe we don't have a good tool for automating data oriented stages. And uh, yeah. And also, uh, we identified the purpose of using automated tools, and we realized that uh, automated tools are mostly used for hyperparameter optimization and uh, data management, model training, and visualization, logging, and uh, storage management, and user interface. ML practitioners can use uh, this result to integrate AutoML tools in their project for similar purposes. Yeah, and also this figure and this plot shows uh, the breakdown of the usage of top 10 AutoML tools based on the purposes. And you can see that, uh, for example, most of the AutoML tools are used for hyperparameter optimization optimization, HPO refers to hyperparameter optimization. And um, if you see my mouse, you see TPOT. TPOT uh, is the only tool that provides some functionalities for pipeline management. Um, it, this result indicates that we need more tools for managing the whole pipeline because each of the components uh, should, these this components of ML pipeline should be connected to each other and we need more tools to facilitate the, the connection between these components. But only one tool called TPOT uh, manage the whole pipeline and the rest of the tools only focus on one or two stages of ML pipeline. And uh, yeah, in the third uh, research question, we were interested to know whether multiple automated tools are used together in the same project and in the same source code files or not. And uh, this table shows an example of automated tool functions that are used together. For example, in the first row, you see that uh, HyperOPT and TPOT are used together. And uh, from the examples that we found in the source code file, we saw that fun F mean function from HyperOPT is called uh, with fit and score functions of TPOT. And the rest of the columns, uh, rows show another example, which I skipped them. And uh, yeah, when we analyzed the source code file, we realized that only less than 8% of the projects use two or more different automated tools, and only less than 2% of the source code files contain more than one automated tool. And there might be some reason for that. One of the possible reasons is that uh, the integration of different automated tools might be difficult. And another reason is that the input and output of these tools may not match together. For example, we may use uh, one tool for feature engineering, and at the end, we want to use the uh, data, uh, the pre-processed feature to train the model, but this input and output doesn't match together. So we cannot use different AutoML tools together for different purposes. So therefore, uh, the future 
developer of Ottoman tools should improve the inter, uh, connection between their tools with other tools. So, uh, and also this heat map shows the correlation between different Ottoman tools and among the few tools that are used together, I can refer to HyperOPT, which is used with TPOT, uh, SCOPT, and Optuna. Yeah, the result of uh, our work can benefit three groups of people. The first group of people that can uh, use our result are researchers. They can study the factors that impact the adoption of Ottoman tools. And also, they, the researcher can investigate the challenges involved in automating the data-oriented task. As I said, we don't have that much tools that work on data-oriented tasks. And we should investigate the reasons behind them and try to resolve them. And uh, because you know that data is very important part of the ML pipeline, and we need to and it takes uh, a lot of time to prepare data for training the model, but we don't have that much good tools to work on data oriented tasks. Uh, the second group of people that can benefit our finding are developers of Ottoman tools. They can use our result to support the most used purposes and the stages of ML pipeline. And also they can add more features. For example, they can see uh, the features that, that the most used Ottoman tools provide and they develop that features into the uh, tool. And finally, and they can improve the, the integration of their tool with other tools. And the last group of people that can benefit with our uh, result are ML practitioners. They can uh, choose the right tools for their project and uh, they can pick the most popular tool for their project. And also if they want to use different auto ML tools for different purposes, they can use our finding to pick their combination of tools that other practitioners used before. And yeah, to conclude our, my, our work, I uh, can say that we identified the most used AutoML tools that are Optuna, HyperOPT, and Scikit Optimize. Uh, we identified the purposes of using AutoML tools, uh, which are hyperparameter optimization, model training, visualization, and so on. And also, we uh, identify the combination of AutoML tools that are used together. For example, TPOT is used with HyperOPT, Optima is used with HyperOPT, and so on. And uh, thank you so much for your attention. If you have any questions, I would be happy to answer. Thank you very much, Farog. Thank you. Does anyone have any questions for Farog? Oh, I see Diego has clapping and his hand raised. Diego, please go ahead with your question. Yeah, so I actually couldn't figure out how to remove the clapping anymore. <laughs> uh, hi, Farog, very nice presentation. Thanks for that. Um, sure. Question that I have is, um, I know AutoML probably has a lot of um, evaluation processes to, to fine tune for accuracy for F1 score and all of that. Can you tell us about the experience on seeing whether this AutoML also incorporate like fairness requirements, robustness testing and things that go a bit beyond just the accuracy of the model? I didn't see, uh, thank you so much for your question. I when, I when we were doing manual analysis and manual labeling, I didn't see anything related to fairness and mm -hmm checking the scalability or robustness and so on. I didn't see Right. It. It's not that they may not have it, but you do not see them using this. Is that correct? Uh, I'm not sure if we have a tool that pay attention to fairness because mm -hmm. we read the description of the tools, but I didn't see anything related to checking fairness or bias or something like that. I'm not sure if they right. provide, but I thought of, about this idea before. It, it's good idea to uh, somehow develop 
or uh, add some functions to these Ottoman tools uh, to for fairness, or at least in the feature engineering stage, at least we should pay attention to fairness and exclude the columns that uh, may induce bias to the yes. model. But Agreed. I don't see, I don't think if we have this kind of features in the in the tools. Yeah, that's a cool idea for a follow-up project. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. yeah, thank you. Thank you, Diego, Dr. Adams. You're next, please go ahead. Well, thanks, yeah, interesting uh, presentation. So um, I wonder, because you're studying a lot of tools, uh, well, a lot of tools, and then for each tool, a lot of projects using the tools. Um, so I'm wondering, did you do any kind of, um, like, did you control for certain things? Because I could imagine some tools are younger than other tools. Uh, some projects are younger than other projects. So uh, are you kind of, comparing everything together or did you kind of split things up based on like more mature tools, newer tools and things like that? <clears throat> we had some uh, criteria for excluding some tools. Mm -hmm. uh, let me remember. Uh, for example, we only focus on the tools that uh, their functions are in Python, but I don't think we pay attention to mature tools or younger yeah. tools. But because it's a I good guess especially, well, yeah, sorry, especially in RQ1, I think there it could impact because I could imagine like a, like a 10 year old tool could have a lot more projects adopting it, so a lot more API calls than say a tool that popped up two years ago but with even other things maybe um a, a tool which has a very fine-grained api so you have to call like six functions to get something done versus like a tool that has like a coarse-grained api like one function call that's it would probably also impact your rq1 results so I, I don't know an easy way of dealing with that but it's probably something to to keep in mind especially rq1 and maybe rq2 as well yeah um, yeah you're right it's a good idea to uh, pay attention to the number of calls to doing the same task that we should uh, compare the number of calls for doing a same task with a uh, number of calls from another tool. Uh, we didn't pay attention to the number of calls for doing the same task. But uh, after uh, publishing this paper, I did some projects at university and in I read some websites and I saw that, uh, for example, our results indicate that HyperOPT is the most used auto, uh, one of the most used Ottoman tools. And I really saw that in the projects after publishing this paper. I saw that, yes, HyperOPT is really used in different projects, in different, I saw that in different websites. But uh, your comment is right. I agree, and in the future work, we need to consider the re, uh, number of calls mm -hmm. for doing the same task. Yeah, you're right. Yeah, or even even things like entropy, like uh, in a given project, or all the calls if like focused in one file, or they spread across multiple files. So meaning your API yeah, yeah. is uh, a lot more coupled we, with the system. We pay that attention. Uh, we sample the function calls that uh, are called across different projects not only for example we may have 10 calls in one source code file and one call in another source code file uh, we i don't remember that quite often because it's for a year ago but i we paid attention to uh the number of calls across the projects cool very good hey, cool thanks good work thank you dr adams for your question does anyone else have any questions for either farog or uh, vahid we have about five minutes or so questions or comments in in general
no questions, but I just wanted to say excellent presentations. Thanks, Farag, and thanks, Wahid. Mm -hmm. I agree. Great job. Thank you very much to our two presenters and to everyone who joined. We had 27 participants at one time. Uh, so that was probably one of our, our highest attendances ever, which is great. Um, and I know we're slowly, well, quick, actually quickly approaching the end of the semester. And I know everyone's getting really busy with them um, finishing up their coursework and everything. But I am looking for two volunteers for the May trainee talks. So if anyone feels prepared and would like to give their presentation um, sometime around probably end of May, third or fourth week in May, um, please reach out to me because I would like to find a couple of people to deliver their trainee talks then. And um, just as an FYI, we will have an industry talks webinar coming up April 25th. So it's only in a couple of weeks, uh, three weeks, I guess. And I will be sending out the details on that soon, but it's from a gentleman who um, is, he was from the National Bank and he's currently doing his PhD uh, here in Montreal. So he's gonna be talking about uh, cybersecurity, very hot topic right now. And I hope everyone can join us for that. So if there are no questions, I guess we can end it here for today. Thank you very much everybody for joining and enjoy the rest of your afternoon. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye.